I don't think I know very many of you. Um, I'm a diabetes psychologist. I live here in San Diego. I run a place called the Behavioral Diabetes Institute. This is what I've done for about, uh, uh, in this job for about 30 years. So it's kind of all I know. I've had the real honor of meeting so many thousands of folks with uh, type 1 diabetes and their families and friends all over the world. Um, we also do a lot of, um, because I'm also a professor at the university, I do a lot of research. Again, looking at the emotional, psychological aspects of diabetes. Um, some of you may have heard about a book I wrote a long time ago called The uh, Diabetes Burnout. I think I was the person who first started talking about this idea of the diabetes police, which caught on. Um, we started writing about that in the late 80s. Um, so um, what I wanted to do, actually, was to address some of your issues. We know some of the major issues that folks with loved ones, and I assume that's who most of you are. How many of you are, are here because you care about someone who has type 1 diabetes, by the way? Okay, and some of you are probably lurking. You actually, how many of you have type 1 diabetes? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so these are the people going to keep us honest, okay? But even though there's a few of type 1s, we're still going to, like, rant on those guys, okay? Um, so what we want to look at is what are some of the things about trying to love someone who has type 1 diabetes has really been tough for you. What's been tough? What drives you crazy? And hopefully because we got a lot of smart people here, we'll think of some answers. I'll tell you some of the things that I've learned over the course of years. We know the big thing is when you care about someone as type 1 is where do you draw the line? How do you find a way to be helpful? How do you find a way to deal with your own fears and aggravations and discouragement? What's too much help? That's the diabetes police aspect. And what's the too little help? So it's finding out a way that fits for you and fits for the person you care about as type 1 that's really been tough for everybody. I can tell you from all our research, um, it's pretty darn clear the number one thing that's most uh, distressing for partners have really always has to do with hypoglycemia, and there's no question about that. Um, so I, what I wanted to do with most of this time, I have my little whiteboard here, is I want to ask you, Tell me some of the things that you have found that have really been tough for you, and then we're going to, but not yet. You're ready to go. Okay, I'll hold my question. <laughs> but I thought I would set the stage and show you a five-minute video. It's my very favorite video. Some of you may have seen this before. It's older than hell. Um, but I love this video. Um, it, it was uh, um, uh, done many years ago. As you'll see when you, when you see this video, have a seat anywhere. The seat's up here if you're brave enough to sit in front. Um, it was... Um, uh, when it was first done, it was by a guy named Mike Lawson. Some of you may know Mike. He's a really amazing fellow. And once I saw this video, I said, I never need to talk about the whole idea of this one th problem, which is the diabetes police problem, ever again, because Mike did such a good job when he made this little video. And you'll see, it looks like Mike made this video for, he must have spent like two bucks. I think he did it in his grandfather's basement or something. You could tell it's very low rent. But I think he captures some of the issues that are important from the perspective of the person who has type 1, not the reason most of you here is because you care about someone, but I think it'll get you thinking. So again, it's to prompt your thinking about what are some of the things that you find tough. Again, lots of seats up here. So bear with me. It's about a five-minute video. Uh, Mike does use, just to prepare you guys, one or two bad words over the course of this. So I hope you can handle it. Okay, here we go. Let's see if Even I can though he wears glasses, Mike Lawson isn't a doctor, a dietitian, or a diabetes expert. In fact, he isn't too smart. These videos are intended to give people a fun way of looking at their own diabetes care and not to substitute for the advice of healthcare professionals. Duh.
Nagging Nancy. She's not a bitch. Well, at least not on purpose. In my life, Nagging Nancy is my mother. Wait, did you catch your blood sugar yet? Yeah, yeah, because you told me that every morning you're supposed to test your blood sugar before you eat anything. Yeah, I told you, so that means I know when I should test. The key to dealing with nagging Nancy is knowing that she actually thinks that she's being helpful. So, take a deep breath, bite your tongue, and thank her. I know, it's not easy. Thank her for being annoying. But what you need to do is recognize that she's trying to be helpful. Thank her for that, and then redirect a little bit. Like this. Thank you. Thanks. You, you know, ever since I've been recording my blood sugar levels, I've never missed a morning. Never. Uh, but you know what I do always forget is I always forget to bring my lunch after I pack it. Maybe you can help remind me. That's all Nancy wants is a little bit of purpose. Misinformed Matthew. Misinformation about diabetes and its management is widespread. And the current trend for diabetes management actually allows for a lot of flexibility. This is something that's actually really difficult for people who aren't completely engulfed in the latest diabetes news to really grasp. It's not like there's a simple list of foods somewhere that you can and can't eat. If there was, it probably looks something like this. Uh -huh. <laughs> and in addition to that, every person with diabetes is different. We're like snowflakes. <laughs> Each of us is working on controlling our diabetes in different ways. What's right for me might not be right for the next guy. So a misinformed Matthew tells you, I know diabetics should, and he goes on to re regurgitate some antiquated research that he read in the 1985 issue of Reader's Digest. Try not to jump down his throat. Again, he means well. He cares about your health enough that he read that article. The problem is that new research is changing how people are managing their own diabetes care. Matthew believes that I can't have any sugar because in 1985, that's what everybody believed. You know, Matthew, in the past, people were told to avoid sugar. You're right. Stroke him a little. Tell him he's right, even though he's completely wrong. But new research has proved that sugar actually has the same effect on your blood glucose level as any other carbohydrate. So we can't eat sweets. We just need to make sure that we're balancing all of the carbohydrates we eat. Misinformed Matthew doesn't like being misinformed. So when you're telling him this new information, you're helping him out. He'll be thankful. Gloomy Glenda. <laughs> Gloomy Glenda is a witch. She's a, the cousin of Debbie Downer. She's the type of person that says things like, how do you live without eating bread? <laughs> or, my uncle had diabetes and he had to have his leg amputated. Or, I don't think I can inject myself. I hate needles, I'd rather die. You might be tempted to say something like, that's funny because I was thinking I'd like to see you dead too. <laughs> Nothing good will come from that. Gloomy Glenda is miserable and she wants everybody else to be miserable too. She's the same bitch that tells you that you're gonna get cancer because you reuse plastic bottles, talk on a cell phone, and use artificial sweetener. Usually Glenda is overwhelmed with her own weight or health problems and without realizing it, is projecting her own self-criticism on others. Gloomy Glenda is the only person on the diabetes police squad that doesn't actually care about you. The best way to deal with Gloomy Glenda is to avoid her. Being around her isn't healthy for you. What sucks is sometimes you can't avoid her. Maybe she's your coworker or your friend's spouse and you don't really have a choice. In that case, just kill her with kindness. Oh, kindness? I thought you were gonna say maybe kill her with recycled syringes. Uh, no, kindness. Oh, Glenda, I'm so sorry to hear about your Uncle Harry's leg and his diabetes complications. I guess that's why it's so important that I stay healthy, huh? You're striving to do the best you can. You're gonna make an occasional mistake. Your loved one should help you manage your health, not police your behaviors. They should 
trust your judgment and offer help, not criticism. Getting harassed by the diabetes police isn't fun for either side. If I'm having a bad day and already struggling for control, I'm already experiencing some pretty intense self-criticism. That's why we find critical comments from others so difficult to take. So if you love someone with diabetes, remember, just communicate with them, but realize when maybe it's time to back off. All right, so that's Mike. I don't know if Mike's here today, but uh, you may see him, so tell him you like to, I hope you do like his video. So you don't have to agree or disagree with what you saw, but I wanted just to set the stage. Again, everyone, uh, some of you have been floating in as that was going on or here because you care about someone who has type 1 diabetes, although some of you actually do have type 1. So, uh, but what I want to do is really direct it, first of all, to those of you who are here because you care about someone who has type 1. And I've got my nice flip chart here, as I mentioned earlier. So now you're going to start us off. I want to hear about what, tell me some of the things about being a loved one that drives you nuts. What drives you crazy? What are you struggling with? Tell me. Too funny. The husband came in, but that's okay. Your he husband came in? in? Uh-oh. He wasn't supposed to be at this one, but that's oh, okay. Oh, quick, cover his ears. <laughs> oh, this one. All right. You know him. Anyway, diabetic brain. Okay? Yeah. With diabetic brain, when there's a real low blood sugar yeah. or there's a real high blood sugar, um, I can often see what I perceive as decisions that are not made in his best interest. That was the most polite way of saying something, but I'm not sure what. Oh, I thought I said it very clearly. <laughs> and therefore, I will make a comment as to some choices he's making about eating something and thinking he needs to eat more yeah. or something else. And, and it's tough to tippy-toe around suggesting that maybe he's had enough for the low blood sugar he's trying to come out of. How's that? Oh, okay. So how many of you are familiar with something we call the I'm fine syndrome? The I'm fine syndrome is when you uh, have a loved one and you think they might be low and you make the mistake of saying, I think you might be a little low, maybe you should check your blood sugar. And the response is almost always, I'm fine. Right? And actually because you've suggested I check my blood sugar, I'm never going to check my blood sugar. <laughs> and I'm definitely fine. Now that's a tiny part of what you're saying. That's but. only a tiny part because I'm saying after there's been after. a test and we know and he knows a number. Right. So you've had your 15 grams of carbohydrate. I'm sure you can just stop now, rather than eat more. And yet most people with type one, in fact, those of you in this room know that the the real idea is if you're low and you you should eat until you feel better, right? Which is usually about a thousand grams of carbohydrates, right, or whatever is available. But that's that's a tough one. What what else? Yes, sir. Uh, my wife sometimes will say, don't tell me what to do, uh, not just I'm fine. And, and, and that goes along with a frustration that she is dedicated to learning more and more and more about diabetes, reading a lot, uh, coming to conferences and so on. But one of my frustrations is just seeing that she doesn't put into practice the things that she's learned and has agreed are better ways of keeping better control. I said too much, maybe. Yeah. She's not here, is she? <laughs> <laughs> she will hear about it. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> so I'm just, just going to think. I'm sure my handwriting is just. what I just said? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, by the way, my wife doesn't have type 1, and she always says, don't tell me what to do. So I, so I think it's a general issue, but uh, in fact, I have to be honest, I think I tell her that as well, probably just as often. Um, and that's a big issue, right? Because she's knowledgeable. You have what you consider to be some good suggestions, yep. and they go nowhere. And we understand what that issue is, right? I mean, most of us as, well, not just grown-ups and teenagers, we like to be in control of our own fate. And the last thing we want is helpful, quote-unquote, helpful feedback. What else? Please. Well, my wife has three glasses now to tell her what her sugar's at, you know, her watch, her phone, and her CPM. Yeah. And when they when they go high, she tends to you know, slam them and throw them. <laughs> the devices? The devices, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah I, mean, I, I can understand her frustration. Yeah. You know that, that her sugar that her sugar's high. Yeah. But I, I'm trying to figure out a way to impart to her that you know that I mean this is something she knows already it's because the device is going off. She shouldn't try to break it. Yeah. You know. It's expensive. Expensive. 
So just to repeat what you're saying, because I don't think everybody heard you. So she has <coughs> three different devices that tell her what her blood sugars are, and when they tell her that she's high, she tends to slam the devices. Right. She's, and I assume that means she's angry at the devices for having the nerve to tell her that she's high. Well, I'm not, that, that I'm not sure about. I, I, know, I know that when I tell her, you know, we, know, we know it's high, it's yeah. not going to help to you know, slam the device. Yeah. You know, and, 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 I think, and of course, the basic thing is she's very frustrated. Yeah, you know, she's aggravated. That, 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 that her sugar's high. You know, yeah. And I'm trying to figure out a way to help her bring that frustration up and down. Yeah. So, and by the way, and again, you may know this, but uh, when we make, when we ask large, large groups of people with type 1, I guess we could have done this this morning, um, what's the number one thing that drives you crazy living with type 1 diabetes every day? So number two is always, no matter what I do, I get these wacky, crazy things that happen, right? So I can imagine your wife saying, Jesus freaking Christ, you know, I did X, Y, Z today, and now I'm having highs again? You've got to be kidding me. So it's extremely aggravating. So the, so the issue is, what, what do you do in that situation? How do you support her in a way to help her with how aggravated she is? Because that's so common. By the way, what's the number one reason? What's the number one thing that drives people with type 1 diabetes crazy? Don't answer if you have type 1. Other people is not number one. You'd think it would be, but it's not. What is it? Lows, you would think so, but no. You would think so. Actually, number one is um, what we call the 24-7 problem. I never get a break. I never get a frickin' break. No vacations, thank you. Yes. I'm a big believer in diabetes vacations, that's the way, but we'll talk about that. Well, yes. The continuing glucose monitor in the middle of the night, how will it be high or be low? Yes. And I wasn't informed that it will keep beeping until it goes to the level that it's supposed to be. And so I used to say to my husband, your sensor is beeping. Yeah. And he said, you already told me. And now I realize just don't, you know, if I tell him once, that's wonderful. But don't keep telling them it again. And if it's high or low, because I still don't understand it that well, yeah. I just let him say that's his problem. And sometimes I go into another room, not very often. But I need my rest too, and he doesn't understand that. He doesn't understand that it keeps me awake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't say anything that it keeps me awake because he would feel very bad and sad. Yeah. Because he doesn't want me to feel sad because of his diabetes. Yeah. So I think maybe I wish that doctors or nurse practitioners would explain to, you know, the spouse how the insulin pump and the glucose monitor works. I've never explained yeah. that, and I wish that they had something like that even at this convention. I'm sorry, Ma, you won't be able to read this, but I'm trying to remember. I want to start with this. So, I, yeah, there's a couple of seats if anybody wants to. This is like the middle seat on the airplane. If you, it doesn't mean you can't run away if, it's, if it gets really bad here. Um, <laughs> So the whole, I mean, this, you bring up a, a bigger issue, not a bigger issue, related issue, which is the CGM alarm issue, yeah. right? So how many of you have partners who have type 1 diabetes who their alarm goes off in the middle of the night, they sleep through it, but you wake up. Anybody have that experience? So that's unbelievably common, right? And by the way, we don't know why that is. I actually uh, was at a meeting once with an, a very well-known endocrinologist. He said, you know those type 1s, I think they just have hearing problems. <laughs> No, that's not true. Um, but, uh, so, but it tends to wake up and worry the spouse and the partner more than, oftentimes, more than the individual with type 1. Well, in a different state, right? You follow. I'm sorry? Yeah. You follow. You can be a different state because of the share system. How many of you are familiar with the Dexcom share system? Right? So that, the Dexcom share is a little over a year old now. And so, if, again, for those of you who don't know about that, so if you have a, you know, you can now follow your loved one's CGM readings from anywhere in the world, actually, on your phone, right? I'm, I'm following several people as well. And that has opened up this enormous Pandora's box, right? You can't wake them up from another state. No. So this has become a, a, a fairly big issue. One of the issues that we've been sort of 
been trying to address, what we see is that for some partners, this has been wonderful, reassuring, life-saving, et cetera. For other partners, they're more nervous and upset about it. And the thing that actually, you hopefully all heard Carrie Sparling talk today. She was wonderful. Uh, Carrie and I have been talking for many months about how much we want to develop a little form for uh, share, Dexcom share etiquette. We think we need a little etiquette sheet, like what are the rules, you know, and I know Carrie's first rule is, um, uh, this is related to what you said actually, you know, if I'm high, don't ask me why, <laughs> okay, and if I'm low, don't get in my face and say, what did you do, okay, not helpful, but how, how, what's the etiquette part, how do we help support people to figure out what to do with this amazing system, but the CGM alarms, you mentioned a number of part of it, so I think it's huge. Please, sir. Um. <clears throat> I, I'm an engineer, and, and, my, and so I'm always, whenever anything, you know, whenever I see my daughter's blood sugar go awry, or if it, it's trending crazy, I want her to, I, I, I've learned not to try to ask her a lot of questions about it, but I want her to be curious and try to learn from it. Yeah. And when she, and I get frustrated with her when she's just like, I don't care, you know, what, it doesn't matter, it just is what it is. I'm like, well, you're not going to learn if you don't think about it. How old is she? She's 23. You know her. Okay. Yeah. So, 23. Yeah. And so she's a newbie. But <clears throat> there's that, you know, the, where it seems like, you know, she's not continually trying to learn new things and also not engaging other people with type 1 diabetes because she just wants to live her life. Mm -hmm. So she just sort of, sort of isolates, yeah. tries to be normal. So let me, just to make sure everybody heard you, just repeat, the, I think the most important thing about what you said. It feels like for so many people probably in this room, it's why you're here, often feels like you care more about their diabetes than they do. Is that fair? Uh, I, I don't know if it's that I feel like I care more, but I'm more analytical. I'm, I'm trying constantly to learn more about it to get to help her get better at it. Whereas she just she her attitude can be I got it, I I gotta live my life. I'm doing I'm doing okay. Yeah. My A1C is good enough. You're more engaged with it than she right. is. Yeah. So, and, and again, you know, when we go through our list and we ask large groups of type 1s, what do you want? You know, what drives you crazy and what do you need? You know, the most important thing is not, wow, I really would like to have the best A1C possible, right? The goal is, can you help me think about this disease less, right? Please help me think about this disease less. And I think that's a problem that often partners and, and parents run into. Right, because you're saying, no, I want you to think about this more. I want you to get really engaged with this disease. I want you to get really specific. And they're going, no, I'd like to be in a safe place. I think is what your daughter's saying. But I want to think about this less. Um, is that fair? I see you nodding over there. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, okay, I'm going to just say more engaged than my. I'll say more engaged than. We'll say him, her. What else? By the way, I'm not sure we're going to solve anything. I just want you guys to all know that other people are similarly going crazy. Hang on one second, please. Um, I think, unfortunately, I fall into the Maggie and Nancy category. They don't want to be. Um, she likes it. <laughs> but especially, especially when I see him dealing with low. And I don't know how to approach, approach him because sometimes I'm met with compliance. Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I probably should have some glucose. <laughs> or, yeah, I will check my blood sugar. Or, but sometimes I'm met with anger. Yes. Or to the point where I really just have to walk away. Occasionally I have to walk away. Yeah. And that's a scary place to be. Yeah, walking away from someone who's really low, you're trying to be helpful, and they're saying, get out of my face, I can take care of this, which probably tells you, uh-oh, that means they're really low. Right. And we've all run into that. I've run into that. I have many friends with type 1, I, and I still remember once out on a hike with one of my friends, and I could tell he was going slower and slower, and he stopped talking. And I said, uh, how are you doing? He goes, I'm fine. And just the way he said, I'm fine, I went, uh-oh. Right. And I remember I tried everything I could think of, right? I said, well, uh, you still have some of those uh, gummy bears? I really like a couple of those gummy bears. He said, stay away from my gummy bears. I'm saving them for when I'm low. I went, oh, 
hmm, um, and we're walking along, and I'm just getting more concerned. And it's a terrible place to be in because nothing I could say was uh, was going to register. I, I have some advice around that. Um, mm -hmm. um, Please. Sometimes it's helpful rather than engage in a dialogue, which is cerebral. Yes. Just hand the diabetic the glucose. Yeah. Just hand yeah. it to him. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't talk. Just hand. So it. let me just make sure you heard that because that is the single most important strategy that's ever suggested. Rather than talking about it, just hand the individual something. Lots of juice, yeah. tabs, whatever. So I've met with hundreds and hundreds of couples who've had the almost being divorced about this issue, right? I mean, it's huge, huge, huge. And I end up playing umpire. I go, well, what do you want to do? And they always come to the exact same solution. <laughs> and, that, and you just said it, what it is, right? So if you think I'm low, here's the deal. If you don't say anything about it, no words, but you just hand me something, and we're going to agree ahead of time what that's going to be, I promise to ingest it or drink it. But there can't be any words. Now, that isn't going to work all the time. No. But it can make it better, huh? Sometimes he may not be low. That's correct. So sometimes... I mean, could, could be high or it could be on the edge. Yeah. Well, you know, it, the, the question about are you correct or not is an interesting one, right? So but we know that, in fact, people with type 1, uh, you know, there's a lot of hypo, what we call reduced hypoglycemic awareness, right? So a lot of people aren't feeling their low. So if you actually, we've done lots of studies, or I'm aware of a lot of studies, more than the ones we've done, where you ask people to guess what their blood sugars are a lot right before they check or before they check their CGM. And we know that... Type 1s are not so good at actually knowing when they're low in general, but there's another group of people who are even more or more inaccurate, and that's loved ones. And it's not because you aren't seeing something. Often you can see it in their eyes or you can hear something in their speech, but because you're so concerned and nervous, you're kind of overestimating often. Because it's your, to your point, you're often thinking, we well, might be low, but, you know. Is he just being annoying or right. an angry at me or is he low? And thank God for CGM, that's all I can say, um, because that is starting to change things. So this is not a perfect solution. I know it isn't perfect for you, but it's having, what we have found is when you can have a couple sit together and say, let's make a deal what we're going to try to do. And if this doesn't work, let's make another deal what we're going to try to do. But you take it out of that angry space and have a discussion ahead of time is the only solution that we've found that makes any difference at all. But uh, I'm... Uh, you were going to say something first. Hang on. Oh, it's kind of different. I mean, I'm, I'm the one who's being the person involved with a uh, normal person. Not yeah. normal. I mean, I'm you're being. being you have type one. I have type one. Yeah. Yes. I figured that out. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know my monster mom. Okay. Do you know who she is? Uh, I don't know. Shirley Babby mom. Oh, okay, of course. Uh, of course, yes. yes. And uh, she is too much. <laughs> too much, too much, too much. All the time, 24 7. Meaning, sort of bugging you. Big time bugging me. Yeah. Yes. She's a pro at it, too. You know that, yeah. Yes. All right, well, hang on to that. I want to come back to her. I want to think about that because her real issue. Please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> So I totally agree with the uh, little louder. About just, uh, oh, speak up if you can. Yeah. I totally agree with the, the suggestion about just handing um, yeah. your up. spouse or whoever your partner um, do whatever they need to to bring the blood sugar up. Um, but how do you, I'm not sure how to deal with the sort of cognitive impairment that happens when you get hypoglycemia and they start treating and they over treat. So you're you're watching them <laughs> treat and you're going, you're going to spike it. Yeah. And in an hour's time, they spike, then they over compensate, and then you're on the roller coaster to a sort of stuff. Yeah. So how do you how do you deal with that sort of that uh, impaired uh, perspective? Yeah. So let me repeat what you're saying. And again, it's something you brought up: is how do you deal with someone who who is treating their lows, but they're just eating in a frenzy, and you wish you could do something. Now, luckily, we have some people with type one in this room, because in truth, I've never found anything that works, because again, what you're dealing when you're low. As you may know, that the, neuro the, the physiological response of being low is a fear response. And, and it is it's one of the first studies we ever did where we actually asked hundreds of folks with type 1 just to register, what do you typically eat when you're low? 
and then we had it all written down and we gave it to our dietitians. This is at the Jocelyn Diabetes Center back east and we had them rate. And I remember the dietitians all came into my room about a week later and said, who are these people? I said, well, these are just normal folks. And they go, well, every single one of them tends to eat like 10 times as much as they need to consume. Because our typical recommendations of what's appropriate have 15 grams of carbohydrates, wait 15 minutes and then test. No one's doing, right? Because everybody is not just emotionally frightened because what's going to happen, but physiologically sort of frightened. But so for those of you who have type 1, what, what do you found? Anything you found that works? Because those are the experts we have to use. Please. Yeah, I, I strongly recommend not saying anything. Okay. Just let it go. Yeah. Because later the diabetic will treat the high yeah. in the accustomed way. Yeah. But on that, really, that's not a battle that's important to win. I would just let it go. I couldn't disagree. I, w I wouldn't want to get in your I'm not getting away between you and food. That much I've learned from all of my colleagues. Please, sir. Just underline a really important point. Uh, the last thing to go in, the, in, the, in the hypo hypoglycemia is like muscle memory. The first thing to go is ration rational mm -hmm. reasoning. So they, I, trying to reason with somebody who's, who's too low isn't, it isn't productive. Work. So it's, it's not like they're being obstinate or ornery. They're, they just they can't function well because of that. So, right. so you hand them point. some, that's the muscle memory thing, just to, in, just to emphasize that. Yeah, and to be fair, I mean, we're dealing with a couple issues here for, for folks with type 1. One is um, there's a subset of folks with type 1, some of them are probably here, who um, have decided that their blood sugar, they have blood sugar goals that are probably not reasonable, that are too low. Um, and because of that, so oftentimes those are folks who we see have, they have an A1C goal like in the 5% range. And for most people, with, even with our best technology, that's not really achievable without having a ton of lows, right? So where do you set a, an A1C goal that's possible for you so that you can have your life too while also staying safe? So um, that's a real important issue. One of the things that we found that's just generally useful, and this is as close as I can get to your question, is um, with all the folks that we see, we always say, at what number, we, we want to keep them out of that danger zone, right? Because I know if you treat a low in, when you're in the 60s, your thinking isn't particularly impaired. It's when you don't catch it until it's much, much lower. And so the big issue for me is asking folks, at what number of course, now with CGM, it's at what number and what arrow. At what place, at what number do you decide, I should stop what I'm doing and address this? Okay. And when I meet someone who says, well, you know, if it's below 40, I'm going to definitely stop and do something. <laughs> Those are someone who, when they know it's low, they're going to eat and eat and eat. But if, they, if their number is a lot higher, that's less likely to happen because they're not as going to be as impaired, right? They're not going to be as in a frenzy. So I always want to ask, at what number do you decide you're going to stop and take action? And can we have a discussion about that? Because is that best for you? I can tell you, having done this for 30 years, the people that worry me most are the people who, when I ask that question, at what number do you treat a low, when they say, well, it depends. And I go, uh-oh, what do you mean it depends? And they go, well, you know, if I'm 50, but, you know, I haven't taken insulin in a while, and I'm thinking about doing this, and this is my current activity, and that's what I did last time, blah, 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 blah. So I decide I can wait it out and not stop for that moment. And last time someone told me that, it was a surgeon, by the way. Um, and I said, so let me just get this straight. Your blood sugar is 50, and you go through this complex cognitive algorithm in your head to decide whether or not it's time to stop now and take some action. Even though at 50, you're absolutely not thinking clearly. And he goes, yeah, that's what I do. So those are the folks I worry about the most and the most likely to have that kind of response. Um, that's an issue. It's more psychological than really mechanical or whatever. I think, I think a lot of it is. Well, it's, it's, it's people trying to... Every, this disease sucks, right? I mean, you're trying to, you want to be safe, you want to have the best blood sugars possible, and you don't want to have any terrible lows. So you're on that seesaw, right? And we're all trying to help. Because that is the way to do it. I mean, that's the, what you're dealing with while we have this disease. Uh, hang on a minute, I'm going to disagree with that. But I want to ask what you, the rest of you guys. What else? What else do you find that drives you nuts? Or what else is important? I'm making a little list here. I mean, you can see I haven't really addressed too much of this, but we're thinking. What else do you find tough, though? Please. 
Um, this has to do with aging. Uh, as my, my wife is in turn 70. Uh, she's over 50 years with us. And uh, as she gets older, I've noticed at times she makes mistakes with her uh, um, and so then she pays the price of this higher uh, yeah. to do. Yeah. And my own uh, kids are wanting me to be more in tune with her medical needs in terms of what doctors go in there. And so I've asked her a question like, okay, um, at what point do I need to know about your pump? I know nothing about what number she's putting in it. Right. She just tells me this much for calories and yeah. she might miscalculate or something and then pays the price, yeah. but I'm concerned at what point do I need to interject and maybe look, go to the doctor with her and learn more about the pump. I think I've asked her one time and basically what she said was, by that time take me to the doctor, I mean, or the, or the, uh, yeah. the hospital. Yeah. Yeah, so how do, you in, how do you get engaged or allowed to be involved in that? Again, the fo as you know, for your loved ones who have type 1, and your wife is a perfect example, she's been doing it for 50 years. She, she's probably not happy about the idea of having someone else drive her car right now, right? I'm driving, as far as I can tell, she's thinking, I'm fine. Again, we'll go back to the I'm fine thing. And I don't need any backseat drivers, especially backseat drivers who don't know how to drive my car. But on the other hand, you're aware that something's not working for her. She need, she may need some help. And bless your heart for wanting to be more engaged, right? And, and number, it sounds like the first thing you're saying is, is you want to be more educated. So I always, what we find is when you when you go to your loved one and say, educate me, please, I'd like to learn from you. Tell me how this pump works. Explain to me how you make decisions. You know, I mean, to me, that's the first step because otherwise you can't really be of any help. So to me, it's it's... It's being a good listener. It's asking good questions. It's not saying, what can I do to tell you what to do? It's how can I learn from you? What are you doing? What do you find that works, that doesn't work? What the heck is this pump thing? Um, explain this to me. As she's getting older, I know she's made mistakes of you know, learning new technology like a cell phone. Yeah. You know, and then these pumps are to me about the same thing. Yeah. Just plugging in information yeah. and hoping uh, you got the right information in there. Yeah. <clears throat> Dr. Alma, we're not talking about you, don't worry. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm just checking in. <coughs> and now we gotta see if my girlfriend's here. Which one? I'm sorry? CGM alarm going off at nighttime. Yeah. What I do, yeah. is a tie, I'll just give her bolus and bolus her to what she needs to see and yeah. just let her sleep. Yeah, don't get the don't get those alarms wrong though. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if it's low, I'll wake her up. Yeah. But I. So you're able. So you have. I, I assume she's aware of this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 some agreement about that ahead of time, and that's the blessing, probably, right? I mean, that's wonderful. That's a good question. We only have a couple minutes left. What else have you found that? Let me shift topics really quickly. What have you found that really has made a difference? What have you found that? helps you to be a successful loved one. Yes, sir. Learning how, we talked about it earlier, but I'm a remote follower, uh -huh. and learning, figuring out what is acceptable in terms of etiquette on how to, how to deal with when alarms go off. Yeah. You know, I learned to, instead of calling her, I learned to text her. Yeah. If it's low, I, if it's high, I don't do anything. Yeah. I just yeah. leave, her, leave her alone. Yeah. If it's low, <laughs> I text her, and it's nighttime. Well, I look at the arrow, right? If it's low and it's level, I I maybe take note of it and listen to the four beeps later. Yeah. But I text her, and you got this. And if if it's if she responds, and I don't, that's it. We're done. If it's arrows going down, I'll text her, and then I wait like four four or five minutes, and then I call. Her. And then I, I, all I say is, you got this. I mean, I don't give her any advice. I just say, you got this. And she says, got it. And that's it. So that's I don't talk to her. We don't talk about the situation. I just, I just want to make sure she's OK. And since I've started doing that, it's quick. It's not intrusive. And also, we both follow our daughter. And so we've had to start talking about who's going to call her. We don't want to both call her. Yeah. It drives her nuts. Yeah. She's in an interview. You know, she's in some meeting. So we're trying to learn how to not yeah. be so intrusive. So it's the etiquette around following. It's really interesting. Yeah. And again, I think one of the solutions that you probably found is that you simply have a conversation with her, and you try different things, and ask her what's OK and what's not OK. You work out the deal. Yeah. 
Yeah, please, sir. Yes, sir. My situation is very similar to that, except it's my wife who yeah. sometimes is working in places where she be in an isolated place by herself for a while. Yeah. And I don't always know what's going on. So when you get this thing where it's dropped down to 50 or high 40s, and that continues for a while, you know, then I have to make this decision about, do I have to call someone to go check on her because she's too far away for me to do that? And so what we finally worked out was when it gets to that point, she will text me and say, I, I saw my numbers, I'm dealing with it. And then I'm fine, because I know that she's doing what she needs to do. And but without that, then it puts me in a weird position, because she might be in a place where she's not thinking clearly enough to do that, and by the time somebody finds her, we could be all different. You've got the deal down because you had the conversation with her. And to me, that is the most important thing. Yes, sir. Uh, one thing that has never caused trouble uh -huh. is something is going on if I just hug my wife and say that. Just give her a hug and don't say anything. I like that. I know one of the things I hear all the time is, is how nice it is, and again, for those of you who have type one in this room, I'll ask you what you think of this, um, how nice it is to be acknowledged in the right way that you're doing a lot of work, that diabetes is a job that you didn't ask for, there's no pay, there's no vacations, it sucks. And it's nice just to be acknowledged. And it's not like, oh, poor you, but just to be acknowledged that I, I salute you for the work you're putting in. And even though you have crazy times when you eat too much, when it's too low, I know what you're. I know how hard you're working. And just that acknowledgement, whether it's verbal or a hug, what I hear over and over again is how big and important that is. What do you think? Is that okay? I think the continued conversation <clears throat> amongst everybody who's shared today seems to be the best solution for any of us yeah. with our partner, daughter, son, whoever. Yeah, and that's a good way for us to stop. You guys are the experts. You guys are dealing with these problems. You guys have figured out, and many of you, these solutions. And to me, what's wonderful about us all being here today is here's a chance to meet other people who are going through some of the exact same things. So I hope you're looking around the room, and we're going to have a chance to do a lot more interaction throughout the day as well, and just have a chance to chat with each other. To me, that's I like to think of this as a giant uh, support group more than more than anything intelligent that I could say. I can see we have a lot more issues to deal with, but hey, we got to stop. But um, I hope I'm going to have a chance to meet many of you today. I'll be here all day today, tonight, tomorrow morning as well. So, uh, but I'm supposed to stop. But thank you guys for. Um, sorry, the room's so warm, but thanks for uh, for being here, and I, I look forward to talking to you guys a little later. Thanks. Right.